Hello students, this is Dr. B and we're looking at the deer mouse fur color in connected biology. We're on activity 10, lesson 4.1, fur color, genes, and alleles. We're using the touch device version. We're on page one. In unit three, you learned about two different versions or alleles of the MC1R gene. R light and R dark, which have DNA instructions for building slightly different versions of the receptor protein. MC1R is shown on left. Remember, in the dark mice, we have this receptor protein, which is a little bit curved, it has a different amino acid here than the light mouse receptor protein, which isn't curved and has a different amino acid here. Uh, it's arginine versus cysteine amino acids, and that's caused by a chain in, in DNA right here on the codon for amino acid 67. There is a C here in the dark mouse and a T here in the light mouse. So those are the two different alleles for making that receptor protein that result in different colored mice because this, this protein in the dark mouse uh, can separate the signal protein and signal the rest of the cell to produce eumelanin, that darker pigment, and this mouse can't break that signal protein and signal to make dark pigment. You also saw the differences in DNA sequences uh, is a single nucleotide that causes a difference in one amino acid in the M1, MC1R gene, which translates to a different MC1R protein. In organisms that reproduce sexually, the offspring, the children, inherit alleles from each of their parents. They get the same genes, but they get different versions of the genes, which are what are we call alleles. Along with the thousands of other alleles, an allele of the MC1R gene is passed from the parent mice to their offspring via eggs and sperm shown on the right. So mom donates an egg, dad donates a sperm, you get a baby mouse. In this unit, you'll investigate the process of passing alleles from parent to offspring and how that process results in predictable ratios of each color in a subpopulation. We often say that genes are inherited, passed down from parent to child, but it's more accurate to say that alleles are inherited. We all get the same genes, but we get different alleles of those genes, different versions. Like it's, you could think of it, we all get an ice cream cone, but some of us get vanilla, some of us get chocolate, some of us get strawberry, some of us get salted caramel, and some of us get Rocky Road. So there are different versions of ice cream. We all get an ice cream cone, but some of us get different flavors. We all have the same genes as humans, but we have different alleles. We have different versions of those genes. Thinking about the difference between a gene and an allele, explain why saying that alleles are inherited might be more accurate. Include your answer a definition of both gene and allele. So a gene codes for a protein or controls another gene. And when I say controls, I mean turns it on and off at different times. Uh, there are different versions of genes that produce slightly different proteins. Those different versions are called alleles. Humans and mice look different, not because they have different genes, but because they have different alleles for those genes. Or you could, you can also say they have different versions or of those genes. What MC1R alleles does the medium brown mouse in the simulation have? 
explain your reason for this prediction. Well, would it be MC1R light or MC1R dark or maybe some of both? You need to make a claim. So you need to explain whether you want 1M1CR dark. I can't do a superscript. So you can just code it this way, MCR light or both. Choose a version, choose an option here as your claim. Um, once you make a claim, come up with some uh, an explanation of why that claim may or may not be true, and then provide some reasoning. For example, I think it may have both, and the reason I think that is it's somewhere between a light mouse and a dark mouse, it's medium brown, so it may produce some of that dark pigment. It may have some functional receptors, but it may not have all functional receptors because otherwise it would match the dark mice. So claim, evidence, reasoning. So here we're back to the simulation. We're gonna zoom into the cell membrane to explore the receptor proteins in the medium brown mouse. Let's pop our medium brown mouse in there. Let's zoom in. Remember, we're going into the cells around the hair follicle. These cells produce pigment that makes the hair light, dark, or medium brown. So we want to zoom in on the receptor protein, so we click here. And we're going to watch both of these receptor proteins pretty carefully. Now watch how the signal proteins bind or don't bind on each of these receptors. This one seems to be working like a dark brown mouse receptor. And in fact, you can see the little curve in this part of the receptor protein. And it's breaking that signal protein in half. We'll wait till a hormone pops in there. And you can see the the receptor protein breaks in half, and we get that comma, that kind of turquoise comma looking protein that signals the rest of the cell to make melanin. This one doesn't seem to be working. We don't see any signal proteins um, bonding there. They're not breaking in half. They're not sending a signal to the rest of the cell to make that darker pigment. So let's answer the questions. What alleles must a medium brown mouse have? Well, it looks like they have a dark allele for the functional pigment, or the functional re receptor pro protein. And a light allele for the non-functioning protein, functioning receptor. How can we tell? How can we tell which one's functioning and which one's not? Well, we can look at the signal proteins. If we look at the signal proteins, we can see they are activated or broken with one receptor. kind of cut in half and not activated with the other receptor. So that gives us a clue that one is from the dark mice, one are from the light mice. And so if you have one of each, you're probably making about as half as much dark pigment as a light mouse. And um, that gives you a clue um, that you're, that's probably what's happening in the medium mouse. Does your answer match your prediction? Yes, it matched my prediction because I thought it might have a dark and light allele. Were we, was I surprised by the answer? Well, maybe a little bit because it could have been a different allele.
or it could have even been a different gene that's functioning differently um, in this particular mouse. All right, let's go to question four. Describe how the vents at the cell membrane are influencing the color produced by the cell. Well, for that, I'm gonna go out and um, go back out to the population here. And I'm gonna collect a light mouse Oops, I have to click collect first. Collect the light mouse, I'll collect the dark mouse, and then we can compare. We can take the light mouse here, we can zoom in. Let's zoom in some more. Actually, we're just gonna measure so we can get a graph going here. I'll show you the graph in a minute. We'll measure the pigments in the medium cell and then we'll measure the pigments uh, in the light cell. Oh, we have to zoom in here. So let's look at the graph here. We know that the light mouse isn't producing any eumelanin. That's the dark pigment uh, right here. The light mouse doesn't have any of it on the light mouse graph. There is some on the medium mouse. Let's go look at the dark mouse quickly. Let's drop the dark mouse here instead as a comparison. Okay, we have a dark mouse in there and we're gonna measure how much eumelanin the dark mouse is producing. Remember the light mouse wasn't producing any, and the dark mouse here has a lot more here than the medium mouse. And the medium mouse has just about half as much as the dark mouse. So that gives us a clue that it has about half functioning receptors that can activate that signal protein and half receptors that can't activate that signal protein. So it's half and half, half functioning receptors that can make, uh, can signal for eumelanin and have non-functional receptors that don't uh, tell the cell to make eumelanin. So it's half light and half dark. Um, what's happening here is the, the non-functional protein isn't activating the signal proteins here. Here, this functioning one is breaking it in half. This non-functional one here in the light mouse, which it has half of, isn't breaking that signal protein in half and signaling the rest of the cell to make eumelanin. So we see about half as much eumelanin in the medium mouse as we do in the dark mouse. And I'll let you write your own answer for question four now that you know what's going on. Let's move ahead here. Let's press the next button, which is just uh, out of the screenshot here. Into the nucleus, the three fur colors you are investigating are a simplification of the real world fur colors of mice. Use only three colors allows learning the basics, but there's much more to it. In reality, there's more to fur color than one gene, two alleles, and three colors. In real life, mice have 20 pair of chromosomes, and the three-part figure below shows the chromosomes of a male mouse. Part A shows an image of the mouse chromosomes taken using a light microscope. That's just a regular microscope that'll sit on your desk. Part B shows the same chromosome stained with a special dye that colors each chromosome pair differently. In part C, scientists use computer-aided generated colors to distinguish the pairs more clearly and also digitally arrange the chromosomes into numeric order. Basically, go into Photoshop, cut out each chromosome, and line it up next to its neighbor that stained the same color. As you will see below in the simulation, we have simplified this to only look at three pair of chromosomes. 20 is a little bit much to look in the model. In the simulation, you can color the three pairs to distinguish them clearly. They represent pair two, pair eight, and the XY chromosome. So here in the diagram, here's pair two, pair eight, and XY. In the simulation, zoom into the cells of each mouse and then into the nucleus of the cell. 
explore the DNA in the nucleus using the controls. So we got here, we'll zoom out for a second. We zoomed into the cell level, and then we're gonna zoom in again to the nucleus level, and we get this uncondensed chromosome in an it's an expanded form, it's called chromatin. When we condense it, it's called a chromosome. You can think about uncondensed chromosomes as a bunch of tangled threads. Um, they're easier to get in here and um, you can find the gene you're looking for, make RNA and make a protein from this part of the DNA but it's really hard to organize if you want the cell to duplicate um, and tidy up so that each, uh, each new part of the cell gets replicates the DNA and each new cell gets uh, two copies of each chromosome. This is a mess. It's hard to deal with and sort out so that each new cell gets half of the chromosomes. Um, it might get half, but it might not get the right half. And the chromosomes might become tangled or torn or broken um, in this uncondensed phase. What chromosomes do when they um, condense is they basically put them on themselves on little thread spools. And these are a lot easier to manage. You can think of your DNA as the thread. It's all curled up on a spool. Matching uh, chromosomes can go together and they can be better organized so when the cell divides, um, each new cell gets two copies of each chromosome. So this is tidy, easier to split up. This is a mess, but easier to find the gene you want and open up the DNA, make an RNA copy so it can make a protein. These are easier to use. These are easier to organize. Describe the physical differences between chromatin and chromosomes shown in the simulation. Well, this is chromatin. It's uh, a lot of tangled DNA, which is perfectly fine if you wanna just make some RNA and make a protein, that's great. But if you wanna organize things so you can make the right number of copies and you can get the right number of copies in each new cell when you're making a new cell, you want to um, curl everything up in a thread spool and condense it so that you can organize and manage it a little bit. When a cell, remember when a cell is going to divide, it really has four of each chromosome. There would be four of each chromosome and each new cell would get two of each chromosome because normal somatic body cells in humans and mice and pretty much everything else have two versions of each chromosome. Bacteria are a whole different thing. We're not gonna get into that. So I've explained the differences between chromatin and chromosomes. You can write your answer to number five. So let's discuss the ideas for potential advantages that each form of DNA might provide. When does DNA get wrapped up into the chromosome and what's going on in the cell when DNA is unwrapped in chromatin form? This is great for making RNA. You can get into a particular strand of DNA. You can find the gene you need. You can, RNA polymerase can get in there, open up the DNA, make an RNA copy. And then you can really make a lot, you can get going, make a lot of RNA copies and you can make a lot of protein if you need to. So this mess is great if you wanna make protein from your DNA. It's not so great if you wanna make new cells and you wanna organize all the chromosomes and make sure that each new cell gets two copies of every chromosome. So the condensed form is easier to organize. So you should be able to um, answer question six. Evolutionarily, cells probably got better at organizing themselves and condensing their chromosomes because this mess probably got tangled, broken, disorganized, and if you try to make two new cells out of this, you might not get the right number of chromosomes in each new cell, and that can lead to big problems. So question number seven, what do you suppose might happen to the DNA of a cell divided 
while the DNA was in chromatin form. What would happen if this big mess tried to divide? Would, everybody, would each new cell get the right chromosomes? Would it get the right number? Would the chromosomes be intact? Or would they break, get tangled, and be messy? You can think about your answer to question number seven, but here's kind of an image to think of of cells trying to divide while their DNA was in chromatin form. Uh, it's kind of a mess. It's hard to pull apart. Um, you don't necessarily get an even amount on both sides. You might not get uh, the copies, the right number of copies of each chromosome you want in each new cell. Um, might be kind of messy. So let's hit the next button and continue. So right now, just for reference, we are on page five. It's out of the screenshot, but we're on page five. So we're gonna use the simulation to inspect chromosomes and find the M one C MC1R gene, on which chromosome is the gene located? Well, I kind of gave you a hint there, but let's go inspect each chromosome. So here's MC1R. It has 10 alleles. You're going to need to know that later. There's another four color gene here that has four alleles. Same thing on the chromosome from the other parent. It's the MC1R gene, it may have a different allele. There's another fur color gene there as well. On chromosome two, there are two other fur color genes, but they're not M1CR, which is what we're looking for. The, um, the pair, the chromosome pair, will have the same genes, but it may have different alleles. And look at this one, it's got 85 different alleles. So there are probably 85 different mutations that have come along in making different alleles for this fur color gene agouti. So here's chromosome X. Um, this is in the XY pair. You have two X's if you're female. There's one fur color gene there with 40 different alleles. That's pretty amazing. If you're a male, I have a male down here, you have an X and a Y. So it's the Y chromosome that determines your biological sex. Obviously, gender can be different than sex. And here we're talking about sex. There are conditions called intersex, where you have not just a tidy XX or XY, you have a, um, various different combinations of X and Y, like two X's or two Y's or just an X or just um, uh, various conditions can cause you to be what's called intersex. And that's a little too complicated to talk about in this particular video, but there's lots of great online resources on intersex. Our exploration of deer mouse fur color, we have looked up at two alleles for the MC1R gene, R, uh, L and RD. That's R light and R dark. However, the simulation shows that the MC1R gene has 10 alleles. Since an allele is a variation of a gene, what do you think differs between the 10 alleles? So in the two alleles that we looked at, it was just one nucleotide which caused one amino acid to be different, which gave the protein a slightly different shape. So here's a word bank for your answer. You could say at least one nucleotide and at least one amino acid, and you could talk about the shape being different. That's not the answer, it's simply a word bank your answer should include at least some of those words. For question 11, each individual mouse has only two copies of the MC1R gene. If there are 10 alleles, why does each mouse only have two? Well, we get one allele from each parent, one from the father, one from the mother. So mice get one uh, copy of their chromosome, one allele, from the mom, one allele from the dad. Let's go over and look here at the chromosome map just briefly to kind of elaborate on that. 
let's go to our somatic chromosome here. So for the fur color gene agouti on chromosome 2b, you get one allele of that gene from your father and one from your mother. One from the mom and one from the dad. It's the same gene on each chromosome here. It's fur color gene agouti, but they're different alleles. And this particular gene, you can have as many as 85 different alleles. That's just nuts. It means there's probably 85 different variations of that particular protein involved in fur color. So one allele from each parent, we get two chromosomes. Um, we get the same gene from each parent. We get two copies of the gene, but we get two different alleles. Sometimes we might get the same, but often we get two different ones which results in a lot of variation in humans and mice and dogs and cats and all other um, sexually reproducing organisms. Including the MC1R gene, how many fur color genes are there on the three chromosome pairs? Well, there's five genes. If you look carefully, there's one on the X chromosome. There's two on chromosome 2, we'll look, those same ones are on chromosome 2A. That's the maternal and paternal, father and mother copies. And then there's two more on chromosome 8. So there's two plus two plus one on the X chromosome, so five genes total. And when you add up all the alleles, like I did over here, there's five genes, which results in 145 different alleles that can control the color of a mouse. That's kind of mind blowing. It's pretty cool. What variations in fur color might the other genes produce? Well, they might control um, other aspects of fur color besides pigment. Um, they might control the length of fur, which might control some of the color. Um, they might control other pigments besides eumelanin. They might control like theomelanin, which is another pigment um, that the cell makes. Uh, you can think of other things that might control uh, fur color as well. So that's question 12. We are currently on page 5 of lesson 4.1. We'll continue lesson 4.1 in the next video and I'll see you there. So this is Dr. B signing off on page 5, lesson 4.1 of fur color genes and alleles of connected biology, deer mouse fur color. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.